Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Hello and welcome to Through the Keyhole, the show that's been described as a sort of blind date for building, <laughs> where you try to match the home with the right celebrity homeowner. As always, we've borrowed the keys to two fascinating homes, belonging to two well-known personalities, and with the help of the sainted Lloyd Grossman, we'll be taking a privileged peep behind closed doors. But the question is, whose? Well, to try and answer that question, we have our panel. Today, on the panel, we decided to go for the uncluttered look. <laughs> Unfortunately, we forgot to tell the panel members themselves, uh, but nevertheless, let's, let's meet them anyway. Our first panel tells me that if he had his life to live all over again, he would make exactly the same mistake, only sooner. <laughs> Mr. Alan Corrigan. <laughs> Our second panelist has just finished her third novel in three years. She's a very slow reader. <laughs> <laughs> will, you, will you welcome Frances Edmonds? And our third panellist is the man who devised the popular television series, Love at First Sight. You'll know that feeling yourself when you feast your eyes on that vision in an electric blue. <laughs> Stephen Lee. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, let me tell you a little bit about the game. With the help of these magic keys, we'll be taking a careful look inside two fascinating homes. And that should tell us something maybe quite a bit, about the person or persons that live there. All our friends here have got to do is to work out who that is. So let's join Lloyd at house number one and watch closely, because remember, the clues are there as we go through the key. Well, I'm trundling along the Thames towpath here. I've always thought a house by the river would be quite nice for any aquarium. Well, whoever lives in this flat is used to taking big and bold decisions. After all, if your front wall has seven doors, you can't shilly-shally. I think I'll choose this one. Well, the walls of this sitting room are decorated with tributes to oldie England. Look, here's a nice view of High Street in Oxbridge, a rather decrepit view of the Chapel of St. Margaret in Oxbridge. And there's a wonderful watercolour extolling the virtues of the old English cottage garden. I also like that set of cigarette cards all about the old traditional counties of England. But this person's horizons are slightly broader than that, because wherever you look in this room, there are a lot of Oriental influences. There's a terrific Chinese wall hanging, a Chinese carpet, and old Oriental patterns all over the fabric here. So this person gets around a bit, is a bit of a jet setter. Nonetheless, their heart really is in Middlesex from the ancient Middlesex of the Doomsday Book right up to contemporary Middlesex as the Thames glides by underneath these windows. This is a nicely astrological duvet cover, so it's not surprising to see that the bedside reading includes the practical astrologer. But of course, whoever lives here eats, breathes, drinks, and sleeps Middlesex, so that book is accompanied by a copy of the Middlesex County FA official handbook. On the wall behind me, a very detailed map of the Blessed County. It almost looks as if someone's planning a military campaign here. Now, this whole room is devoted to Middlesexism. Framed tea towels and a beautiful old cast iron county marker. Middlesex sports are very important to this person as well. He's a devoted supporter, for example, of Ryslip Manor FC. Well, whoever lives here certainly has a flamboyant personality because they've taken this rather spartan white kitchen and jazzed it up with some highly colored accessories. This bright pistachio radio and a canary yellow kettle. Now, let's look at the evidence. Medieval Middlesex. Practical Astrology. The Ricelip Manor FC supporter. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you very much, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, though not for our panel, here's whose house 
It is. We begin with the wise one, Alan. This is someone who doesn't actually have anything to do with cricket, Middlesex, but probably football, Middlesex. Is this so? Well, I don't know whether Middlesex had a football well, team. Well, he had Yedding on the wall as well as Ricelip. Now, I happen to know Yedding is a, is a great club. Um, and I wondered who will be interested in two uh, great do, Middlesex football clubs. Do they play club. Cricklewood? <laughs> <laughs> Not often. Not often. But this, this person has a bob or two. Yes. And um, I would have thought, uh, I would have guessed, that he probably wasn't a sportsman himself. I had the feeling of a man... Francis. Um, obviously, whoever it is, and I think we're looking for a man here, because there's a... There's a there's <laughs> you know, my feeling is, too, this is a lovely house on the Thames, but there aren't a lot of knickknacks there. I think it might be a secondary, a secondary house for this person. You know, sort of like his away-from-home place. Well, you, are, you are absolutely right about that, and I'm, I'm very impressed by our audience knowing these details as well. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, there's just, there's just no knickknacks there. My feeling is that I think the secret is in the duvet cover, is my feeling. Uh, OK. Stephen, over to you. David, what a fabulous programme this is. I never believed I'd actually see the inside of Mystic Meg's bedroom. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> um, I do say I agree with you. I, I think the secret is in the duvet covers, and I, I think it's an astrologer, perhaps. <laughs> I, I, I do think that he must have a very boring life because it's only Middlesex that preoccupies him. No, 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 the, the, no, the Edmonds family have been preoccupied with Middlesex all their lives, all their married lives. I, I think it's not just football this man's interested in. I think he probably is interested in cricket too, although there was no. Um, sign of that, but I just think somebody who has a, a bright yellow kettle and a, a green radio and has an astrological duvet and loves little sex must be Russell. <laughs> so let's say, come through the keyhole, Russell Grant. Yeah. There you are, a terrific welcome and an astrological pulley. Pulley. I thought it reminded us of our days when we were doing those early morning. You're still doing them now, of course. On a Sunday, on yeah. a Sunday, and uh, very much so. I'm enjoying it very much. But, but you were doing it regularly, and what well, you still do, you still do astrology everywhere, really. You are Mr. Astrologer. That's right. Now, S Stephen was amazed Stephen. that it was your house. Why were you amazed, darling? It, it seemed quite austere, if I may say, Sir Russell, because I've known you some years now. I didn't know it was his house. I've known him so many years now. Well, um, Steve, yes, Steve, in my first break on telly, you know, Granada Television, all those years ago, live from two. That's true. 1978? Was it? Yeah. There we are. So, have you had this gift? How old were you when you discovered this gift? When you were eight, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I mean, I actually worked in the psychic world um, with that you, late, great Doris Stokes was where I um, actually really got into it more. But then I became an astrologer about the age of 15, 16. And you don't have to be psychic to be an astrologer. You can actually go out and learn astrology. Anyone can do it. But the psychic world, yes, I got involved with at a very early age. And what, and what did you find out, or what did you predict? Well, it wasn't so much prediction. It was the fact that um, I got this very strange feeling. In fact, my mum was driving a little um, mini, and... Um, I saw the wing dented in, and I said to my nan, Mum's had an accident. So she said, what do you mean? So I said, look, the wing's, the wing's dented in. So she said, it's not. And it wasn't when I looked again. And um, Mum came back later that day with the wing dented in, because um, uh, uh. she had an accident. So I'd seen that in the morning. So whether that's a prediction or just basically being able to, um, you know, foresee prediction, forecast, who knows. If I'd have seen Mum, I could have perhaps, if I'd have known, told her to drive carefully. That's really the art of, of this, is that you can use it as a warning. What's been your most stunningly accurate prediction? Oh, goodness me, I suppose, really, um, Mrs. Thatcher. <laughs> um, when, on TVAM, we did um, a, a programme on her 10th 
anniversary of being Prime Minister, um, I was asked to do her chart. And I was able to tell from her chart that in the November following, um, 11 years I think it would have been, that she would be... 11 and a half. 11 and a half years. So the November following, she would be like stabbed in the back by the backbenchers. She would lose power while she was abroad. And it would be over the economy in Europe specifically, and that John Major would actually take over from her. And in fact, what was um, really amazing about that was that Jonathan Ross had seen me say this, like, you know, 18 months earlier. And when he was doing his chat show on Channel 4, he asked me to go on. They played that particular piece that I'd said all those months earlier. And what had happened was they, they had the three runners to be the next Prime Minister, John Major, Douglas Hurd, and Michael Heseltine. And he said, who is going to, you know, win? I said, John Major, and he'll become Prime Minister again in April, the following April. And um, he said, well, Michael Heseltine is a favourite. How can John Major win? But of course, John Major did win. And uh, basically, the following April, can around I, your birthday, he became Prime Minister. And can you tell us the result of the next election? Well, I think it's going to be Tony Blair, and I'm going back now um, a year, something that was said in the Times Diary when they rang me up. Um, and I didn't have all of his details then, but I, I said that 1997 would bring a change of address, and I really feel that will probably be Downing Street. But a change of address, it could yeah. be... It could be just moving, of course. <laughs> <laughs> but we've only just got his time. But a year ago, 1997 is... Um, a very profound time for him, and uh, I think that it will be, uh, I think he'll be the next PM. Well, thank you for your predictions, and uh, at least he knows he's definitely moving, and it's up to him to make sure of where it is he moves to. And come on your show. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which we look forward to. And here is the key that says thank you to the star of stars. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, dear Russell. Lovely. It's been a pleasure as ever. Uh, great thanks to you. We'll take a break. I wonder who's next. Thank you and welcome back to Through the Keyhole with Lloyd Grossman. It was Lloyd who said, never forget that the word American ends with, I can. <laughs> <laughs> Wise words, I think. You all agree. And Lloyd is surely living proof of the truth of that wise old saw. <laughs> so let's join him right now at house number two, as we go through the keyhole. But as you enter the house, you come straight into this big, wide, and handsome room, which is like a cross between a hall and a drawing room. Now, you'd have to be pretty dull not to notice that whoever lives here is crazy about horses, because indeed, everywhere you look, there are horses. Horses in the pictures on the wall, horses on plates, and plenty of bronze horses all over that brick wall at the end of the room. Now, there's a big grandfather clock of a type called a regulator clock in the corner there. So that probably shows that someone is very concerned about precision and timing and having everything just right. However, I noticed the clock isn't working, but that's probably another story. 
Now, all the furniture in this room is big and chunky and comfortable. So I think these people like comfort. They like treating themselves well. It's all very, very prettily arranged. This is a very interesting desk and chair with a side chair on either side of it. Once again, it shows a lot of precision. It's very symmetrically arranged, very neatly arranged. And look, more horses even here. In this case, little horses around the picture frame. This is a beautiful conservatory. It's got a nice tropical feel, you know, with all this sort of bamboo furniture and these green plants and pots. And of course, it's got a clock in it, which like the one in the hall isn't working either. And there are horses here as well. Terrific bronze of a couple of horses and wonderful horses all over this sort of Persian carpet. Now from the conservatory, you come into this sort of snug little room. I guess it's a, a bit of a den. It's dominated by this big black electric massaging chair. So maybe someone in this household has a bit of a bad back or certainly does something that's physically very strenuous. Now there seems to be a lot of bird houses because when I look around this room, there are lots of bird cages, birds' nests, birds' houses. So someone's a bit interested in birds. There's a particularly fascinating selection of videotapes. Look, on the one hand, B.B. Blocksberg, a German children's videotape. So this might be a bilingual household. And on the other hand, karaoke hits. So someone here might be a bit of an exhibitionist. Well, this master bedroom is per top of the house. It occupies a terrific space. It's got this very interesting gambrel roof, and there's a nice porthole-shaped window punched in the wall to bring even more light in here. Now, it seems to have a very sort of German or Central European feel to it, I suppose, because of these strong color values. We've got a very nice green and lots of bright white. Once again, it's a very neat, precise, very sort of correct and proper room. It also has a bed the size of an aircraft carrier. I haven't seen anything that big for a long time. But even here, there are little hints of horsey culture. Just look at that coat hook. Well, I suppose having to climb these steps gives bath time a real sense of occasion, doesn't it? Now, of course, there are horses in here because there have been horses in every room of the house. But I'm a bit more fascinated by the ducks. Now, some of the ducks in here are actually quite smart. These sort of china ducks holding soap. But maybe a duck that's slightly more revealing is the rather jolly Olympian version of Ed the Duck. Now, let's look at the evidence. The precision timekeeping. The bilingual household. The horsey artifacts. Who lives in a house like this? David, it's over to you. Well, thank you, Lloyd. And now for our home and studio audience, here's whose house it is. <laughs> And, uh, Stephen? Well, it's quite obvious we're talking sport. We're talking here a German gymnast because of the size of the bed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could well be true, but it isn't. <laughs> um, I think that the, the, all the horses, the actual um, horses with jockeys on, as in horse racing, was a false lead. I don't think it's horse racing. I think it's more... <laughs> Thank you. Um, more show, show jumping. Um, all right, well that, on to you, Francis, at that stage. Yeah, I mean, we won't tell whether it was a man or a woman, but with the lacy um, nightgown and the hat, there was a straw hat there. It must be a woman, three-day eventer. Oh, it's oh, not. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, OK, it's cross-dress. No, <laughs> no, no, German three-day eventer. <laughs> three-day eventer or no three-day event. Think um, about the straw. In fact, we are... Sorry. The household, there is a man, the woman who lives in this household, but it is, in fact, the man that you're We're looking for the man, oh. I, I think this is someone who rides horses with a great deal of precision for a very long time, because you need a massage chair if you do that. <laughs> uh, and I think they are... Well, I think that is... German or not, I, I think they're uncomfortable. And uh, they're clearly um, cross-country or whatever. 
they are eventers. They, are, they spend a lot of time on the horse and come back home and get into the electric chair. <laughs> or the horse gets into the electric chair. Maybe it's the mafia. Perhaps they just go to bed and there's a horse in Eddie. Yeah, yeah, that's possible. There's room for that. But as you say, there's room for the whole horse in that bed. Now... Is this a German name? No, I, we'll find out why all the German singers, but it may well be the lady of the house may be responsible for that. Ah, ah. That's so a it's a male, it's a male British show jump. Olympic show jumping champion. <laughs> Five? Yeah. <laughs> there are so many. I mean, where do we start? Now, you've got a zero in here, and you may not, you may not make it. I'll give you one final clue. He's a current Volvo World Cup champion. And that's, that's not cars, that's uh, horses. Is that, now, is who you going to That would be a great clue. clue. Yes. <laughs> it's not easy now, I tell you. I don't think you're going to get this. You're going to kick yourselves. Yeah, we are. When I tell you that it is, in fact, the current Volvo World Cup champion, Nick Skelton. Oh. And here he comes to the keyhole. Great to see you. Come and take a seat. Well, congratulations, congratulations on uh, beating the panel. Actually, they were very close at the end there. I was worried about your back. Alan was worried about your electric chair. Is that <laughs> to keep you fit or to repair yeah, it's, wounds? Yeah, it's to repair the wounds, really. You get a lot of lower back problems and sitting out at night and watching television and that keeps going up and down your back and lower back is where you that's get the different. I guess that's the difference between um, fun riding, which people like us do, and competitive riding because it's possible actually for an old man like me to stay in a saddle all day because it's actually very comfortable on a horse's saddle until you make it do something really rather serious <laughs> and then all your vertebrae end up in your boot. And, and, and yeah. there's, there's a moment when it changes into something yeah. painful, isn't there? Because it's otherwise yeah, it's a comfortable the thing. Yeah, it's the falls that you get all the pain from, really. And, uh, okay. Well, you get quite a few of those. Someone, it's because of Bettina, is it, the, the, the German influence? Yeah, my it's not girlfriend's, your... uh, she's German, and that, hence uh, the um, German tapes, because her daughter was German. Mm. Yeah. And then the bedroom, she did that, and that's all in German, so... Mm. And the lacy negligee, so... Yeah, that's not mine. <laughs> 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 Why all these stopped clocks, unless you don't wind them? Or yeah, well, they'll put batteries in. Was the there any sort of metaphor the, there? The one that's conservative, the batteries ran out. I yeah. think that <laughs> <laughs> the grandfather clock, I think it's on a bit of a tilt and that stopped working. Oh, so there was nothing in that at all? Not really. No. No. <laughs> no. And, this, and this thing, I mean, Lloyd's clear about, in one of the clues at the end, the precision timekeeping. Are you a precision <laughs> timekeeper? Well, the job, our job is on, is quite precision timing, really. We need to jump off some things, so I mean, that's... It's about the only uh, similarity between that and the clocks. Is yeah. that mass massive collection of horse horsey things totally collected by you, or is it the sort of thing that people now give you because they know you collect horse things? <laughs> no, they're, they're generally um, trophies and things, like the bronzes and the carpets and the, the clocks. Well, this, this, is, this trophy is neither a horse nor, <laughs> nor is it very German either. Uh, but it's our way of saying thank you to you both. Thank you very much. For letting us visit with you, and it's been great fun. Thank you. Thanks a million thank for everything, thank Nick. You. Thank you. A huge thanks, then, to Nick Skelton. <laughs> and, of course, to Russell Grant as well. Not to mention Alan Corrin, Francis Edmund, and Stephen Leahy. And our thanks to you, too. Until next time, goodbye for now.